This is Tom Koslick, the head of research and analytics at Hilltop Securities. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this episode of our Hilltop Talks Politics and Finance podcast series for 2022. During these discussions with subject matter experts, we consider topics that intersect the areas of politics and finance at the federal, state, and local levels in the United States. We often concentrate on issues related to U.S. public finance and the municipal bond market. Today, we have Jeff Bushwick from s p Global. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. We really appreciate you making the time, especially with all the things that are going on. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. So Jeff is a managing director and sector leader in the U.S. public finance government's team at s p Global Ratings, and he is based in Boston. And we are recording this a little over a week after Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. It's uh, we're recording this on March 4th, and I think that's important to mention. This is because the, it seems like just in the last week, uh, a lot of things have changed. And today, Jeff and I are going to discuss some of the most important topics that state and local government leaders and municipal bond investors are considering uh, as kind of this the the old COVID era ends and the new COVID era gets underway, but also in this new era that is uh, is underway as a result of the geopolitical events that are going on in uh, Eastern Europe. We're going to uh, the specific things that I'd like to talk about today uh, are related to cybersecurity. That's a big issue. It was a big issue even before last week's invasion. It's even a bigger issue now. I also wanted to talk about how inflation is potentially going to be, well, how it is, and then potentially going to be uh, impacting the, the public finance and public, public sector. And then I'd also like to briefly discuss a topic that has seemed to be a little overlooked over the last couple of years. And I think that one of the reasons for this is because uh, equity market returns, they haven't been great in the last couple of months, but equity, equity market returns in 2020 and 2021 were pretty, uh, were, were pretty good. Uh, but that topic has to do with public pensions. That's something that I'd like to, to talk about a little bit with Jeff as well. So Jeff, I, inv I investigated some specifics about cyber related attacks in a podcast I recorded back in February with an analyst. Uh, from Fitch Ratings, but today I wanted to visit some kind of next level higher topics with you. And and first I'd like to talk about and kind of figure out the steps that you're seeing state and local governments take to prepare uh, for cyber attacks and other cyber related uh, situations. I saw some comments on social media uh, a week or so ago from uh, by Robert Lee from Dragos, a cybersecurity company, and he said that, quote, the most meaningful work on cyber is done well ahead of a crisis or attack, unquote. And he went on to say that that journey or the preparation could could take two to three years before an organization has anything of significant value to show for their work. And I'm wondering, Jeff, do you agree with Robert and what it is that you're seeing on the front lines related to kind of that timeline? Yeah, sure. No, um, Tom, the, I always enjoy catching up and, and hearing from you and talking mm -hmm. about credit issues. I, I did listen to that uh, other cyber uh, podcast that you mentioned. I thought that was well done and shared a lot of great information. So, um, yeah, let, let's let's continue to talk cyber. Mm -hmm. It is it is so key right now. But and yeah, the, those comments from the cybersecurity company that you that you you cited there they ring true right that's what we're looking for that that pragmatic evaluation of cyber vulnerabilities and that prudent preparedness around attack avoidance and thinking about what you're going to do to recover and if you have the right liquidity and and expertise in house i mean all that helps mitigate risk and it can take a while it can take a couple of years and so i think what he said makes all the difference um you ask front lines, and I think uh, front, front lines right now have to be the cyber attacks that are happening inside of Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. Look, there's a high degree of uncertainty, right? No, no one really knows the extent this will uh, be, the the outcome, the consequences of this 
military conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. But, you know, irrespective of, of the duration of the, the hostilities, sanctions and the political risks that are associated are, are likely with us for a while, and that, that affects credit. The, these This could really affect over time commodity markets, let's say oil, gas, and and, and wheat, things that, that come from this region. Supply chain, which is something we'll talk about. Inflationary pressures, which you mentioned you want to talk about, mm -hmm. could lead to growth issues. It, it could affect capital markets, as you've just said, last few months, part of it with this has affected capital markets. And then, right, the front line, the increased cybersecurity risks. Um, you, you, this week we were talking and you saw the FBI and the U.S. Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, what CISA, they had a joint alert talking about the malware strains being used against the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you quoted, and I'll quote, they say, this may unintentionally spill over to other organizations and other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what happened in NotPetya, right? Back in 2017, it began in the Ukraine and spread to public finance, primarily ports and public finance, disrupting for a, a couple month period how ports operated in public finance. And I think that the thing that that is unique and different from what's happening now to what we've been seeing recently is that the malware strains they talk about, Whispergate and Hermetic Wiper, these aren't aimed at stealing money. They, they're not trying to get intellectual capital. They don't want your personally identifiable information. It is the the operational system itself and the backups. This malware targets to destroy what you do, right? That's meaningful. So if they leak out, if they spill over as the the, the FBI warned, you know, that is, is is a different challenge for all, right? This is disaster recovery. This is business continuity planning. These these are things, um, yes, they're cyber focused, but those risks are meaningful. So we we are looking at the front lines there. We're trying to see how people are preparing. But as you started with the question, you know, if you're starting now, it's going to be difficult to catch up, which is why we've been talking about cyber for a few years and trying for to gauge, years, right? gauge that ability. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that uh, a lot of uh, folks on the technology side describe this uh, or, or the kind of the tactics on the one hand, kind of maybe all the way to the extreme, there could be uh, these kind of shock and awe type of attacks. And then a little maybe towards the middle, you've got attacks that are more targeted for disruption. Is it, am I right in saying that the types of things that we've been seeing have more in Ukraine, uh, right, you know, over the last couple of weeks, have, if not months going back to the beginning of January, as I'm thinking about it, they'd be more described as disruption and not necessarily shock and awe yet. Would that be the right way to, to describe them? So the, the they're they're purely disruptive. Yes. Okay. Right now okay. they're they're trying to um take down the the various government agencies and the ways that the Ukrainian government can communicate with its its people or amongst itself in different divisions. And so mm -hmm. it's 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 pretty disruptive. Um I think there is a bit of the shock and awe aspect of it as well, too, because if you can take it down permanently, it, it probably gives an advantage mm -hmm. of, of some way. But um, th it's it's mostly been the disruption. Let, let's stop the operations. And that's why they're targeting it in this way. Okay. I wanted to ask about kind of the, the market's perception, uh, you know, municipal credit analysts perception specifically of how prepared state and local governments are for cyber attacks. And I'm going to cite some data from the uh, credit analyst survey that we published back in December of 2021, where uh, only 6% of analysts surveyed said that state and local governments are on their way to being prepared. No analysts said that state and local governments are very prepared or just prepared. So uh, that to me is says that there is a lot of work to be done uh, uh, where cyber is concerned from analysts perception. Is that is that perception the reality of where state and local governments are with uh, 
kind of the cyber preparedness of where state and local governments are right now? You know, I, I don't think 6% is a fair number. I think there is better preparedness in the, in okay. the market. Um, I've been, I've attended a few National Association of State uh, Chief Information Security Officers, so NASIO's mm-hmm. events. And over time, they do the state-by-state state surveys. And I, I'll say it was their 2017 or 2018 state survey where um, there were over 30, I think, states that, that didn't have a coordinated plan. But that was back in 17 and 18. I think two years later, everyone had a, a, a plan at the state level. Mm-hmm. And I think if uh, the, the recent examples show the, the better communication that's out there and the support that governments are showing to each other, I look at um, – Two states, right? The state of New York, soon after the the uh, uh, action in in the Ukraine, activated a um, cyber. Uh, I forget what they called it. It's it's like a cyber bunker where the state is functioning with other agencies around mm-hmm. um, New York to ensure that if if an event were to occur, if if somebody needs help at some level of government, they're there and they're monitoring. Mm-hmm. And um, I saw also that the state of Iowa. Uh, has a cyber bunker as well. And because of the events in the world right now, they're going to 24 hours a day where they weren't before. And so mm-hmm. I think there is that, um, the the recognition that this is a meaningful risk. I think there is activities happening within the public finance sector. Maybe it's not as visible as every analyst may, may want or understand, but there mm-hmm. is a lot out there. Um, I, but I do say that there, it's a challenge. The skill set that you need to hire, to um, prevent a, a cyber attack, to prepare a, a, a large organization for a cyber attack, is the same skill set that a corporation needs. And one of the challenges that public uh, finance agencies have is, look at, you typically don't pay the same, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you're a cyber expert and you have the opportunity to work for a government at one pay scale or a corporation at another, very often that corporation pay scale wins. Mm-hmm. So it is a case of, can you get the, the the people and can you keep the people? But what we've seen is the risk is there, the recognition is there, and so there's activity in the public finance sector. It's not it's no, nowhere close to a six percent lag of no, no one's on the right track. I would say most are on the right track. It's it's then can you finance it and can you staff it mm-hmm. to get to a place where you are uh, protected a- along with some of your corporate peers. So let me ask let me uh, ask how it is that. SMP is incorporating a uh, kind of cybersecurity preparation into its ratings and ratings criteria. Are there uh, examples in what it is that you've seen over the last, you know, not just a couple of months, but a couple of years that shows, you know, goods, uh, you know, a, a preparedness steps that are being taken that, uh, bolster the ratings or on the up opposite end are there situations where uh, there are holes in what it is that some entities are doing yeah it, it's we, we've been I think we first wrote about it in a credit report back in 2015 in public finance when there was an attack and so we've been trying to put out a, a thought commentary saying here are the types of questions we're asking and why we're asking uh, at least once a year, sometimes twice a year for the past five or six years. Um, so back in 2015, did that actually change your rating or that was just like from what you remember the first time it was mentioned? So the 2015 one that I'm thinking about was um, the Lansing Power and Light Board up in Michigan. Okay. And they were hit with a, a, a cyber attack uh, of ransomware and they opted not to pay. Um, but so they they didn't pay it was it was a small number i don't have the numbers on the top of my head mm-hmm. but it was something like a couple thousand dollars right mm-hmm. but then in order to prevent the attack from happening again they went and they spent i'd say it was like a million or something to update their systems and mm-hmm. and harden their software and, and per, do take the necessary steps so rather than pay 2000 they they spent a lot more now they had cyber insurance cyber insurance carried a part of it but it was a liquidity event where they could draw down and spend more money than they anticipated, but it, they they did what they needed to do to get to a better protected place. Mm-hmm. And so I think the surprise for us at the time was, look, you could have paid two thousand and you end up spending a million. You know, is that the right management decision? And their discussion was what really got us thinking about credit. Their discussion was, this is absolutely what they needed to do because 
they are protecting their system against future attacks and they needed to update all this anyway. Why give in to a, a criminal element when you're going to take this event over time? They had the luxury of extra liquidity to accelerate that capital project mm -hmm. and move it in. So it didn't change the rating, but it got us thinking about credit mm -hmm. and what we should be asking other issuers. And that was back in 2015. Before, yeah, I think that was well before year. several years before a lot of us, whether it be on the analyst side or you know the market and on the uh, public finance issuer side, we're really. Uh, or I guess I should say thinking about it as much as we have been over the last couple of years, right? Yeah. So we've been we've been we've been thinking about we we'll ask those questions. We 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 um we really don't want the details. We don't want to know what server you're running. We don't want to know who you hired to protect, right? Those things aren't um they're interesting. Maybe you could see uh, some trends evolving, but what we want to know is that you're cognizant of this risk. You're taking it seriously. You're taking those steps to Identify where the risks may be. What what information could be stolen? What intellectual property should be protected? What um, public safety measures should be thought about? So, mm -hmm. explain to us how you're identifying what you need to protect, and then tell us how you think you're protecting it. And then, if there's a, an attack, because we've been saying right, it's probably more likely that you will be attacked than you won't. So, if you're attacked, have you thought about would you pay or not? Who's going to talk, contact the press? Who has the right to shut down your your systems? And do you, if if you need to recover, as that um, electric company I just talked about is, um, do you have the cash on hand to recover in a meaningful way? So we we we're, we're getting that anecdotal information from management and those who talk about um, uh, tabletop exercises with state level experts um, hiring parties for endpoint protection, uh, monitoring your system. It, it helps us to gauge to say, OK, this is a recognized risk. You're addressing it in a good way and we can write about it. And where we've been writing about it is in some of our um, ESG paragraphs. So the mm -hmm. environmental, social and governance paragraph is something we've put new over the past year in every report. And so we may say, you know, the the cyber protective uh, measures are strong because they've done, and you could list a couple of those things, or you could just say, you know, they are um, in line with peers for some of the cyber protective measures as well. So we're trying to get out there to, to get the analysts on in our shop to think about this risk, have a meaningful discussion with the management team on the other side of the table, and then without jeopardizing their actions talk about um, in line with uh, what the credit risk may be. Mm -hmm. well, now I'd like to turn the conversation to another topic that uh, is very important to uh, folks on the public finance side, whether it be on the state local government area or folks on the uh, public finance investor side. And that is the topic of inflation. And I know that you recently authored a report uh, Dave Hitchcock David Hitchcock was the primary analyst on this report but I know that you uh, added to this report it was a, it's called how inflation has mixed effects on US state and local government credit quality and I'm wondering if you could share with the listeners some of the kind of pros and cons or positives and negatives uh, that you and David and the other authors in that report wrote about yeah, no, it, it's um, it's great to be a colleague of of someone like Dave. He has an incredible memory. Uh, he's been with us for about 40 years, and so he remembers the 1980s inflation, right? So many in our industry have started since that time and don't don't have it, including myself. So, you know, it he, he started to have discussions within our team of you know here are the aspects of inflation that you know, could be short-term credit positive or, or longer-term credit negative, and how do you think about it? And we felt that was something to share with the market. And so that that's what we tried to do, right? We don't expect all the changes brought on by higher inflation to be detrimental to credit quality. Mm -hmm. I think everyone hears inflation and just thinks it's detrimental. But if you think about that, um, the revenue mix many places have, it, it if, if things cost more, it may mean, in theory, that you're collecting more sales taxes. If, if your home costs more, then property taxes could be up, or real estate transfer taxes could go up. If you if you if you get a raise to help counter inflation at your company, then your income taxes could theoretically go up, right? So you have this 
um, boost. And I think some of the really strong revenue collections that we've seen over the past half year year have had inflationary benefits from it that th th they didn't budget for these levels because they didn't see this level of inflation. And so these taxes come in a little stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't want that to sound like only a good thing because really in, in, you start looking at inflation and you see all sorts of pressures. It slows growth, right? It increases your cost of capital. It exacerbates income inequality. It could lead to, to higher um, social service spending. So short term, you know, when you don't expect the inflation to come up this much, you don't budget to get this type of revenue, these taxes increase a bit. Longer term, though, as you're trying to adjust to it, man, these costs could counter that short term gain. And that's what we're trying to watch now is the longer term pressures and costs um, covered by what you just got that was unexpected or is it going to exceed that? Yeah, in my mind, one of the things that I think is one of the <clears throat> key credit risks that and we ju we're just not going to really answer yet would be a situation where uh, because and especially because of the issues that we're that we're experiencing in the labor market right now if there are situations where labor contracts uh, you know multi-year labor contracts have to re be renego renegotiated and if they have to be renegotiated or agreed to at levels that are not just slightly higher but a lot higher now for a, and if that has to, has to occur for a multi-year period of time, uh, the folks who are receiving the benefits from those contracts are going to get a great deal. But on the other hand, as inflation, uh, whether or not it's just something that's going to be here for the next couple of months, or you know, it, I mean, it's it's not likely that it's going to be this high for this long. But if there is an imbalance about where con labor contracts are agreed upon, multi-year labor contracts are agreed upon, you know, in the next couple of months, if not the next year, and then inflation falls, it seems like that is something that could pressure budgets in a few years from now, if that makes sense. That that seems like something that not a lot of people might be focused on, um, and it might not necessarily be as uh, influential as our next topic when we talk about pensions, because those are things that have gotten have have risen um, and worsened over time. But this is something that I don't think that a lot of people have maybe really been focusing on. It just is that something that uh, analysts in the state and local government teams are thinking about, and and are you seeing uh, situations where that could happen, where there could be multi-year labor agreements that could start to pressure if uh, inflation starts to fall. No, you're you're dead on there. It, and actually, that's one of the things that as Dave started talking with us about some of the things that he's seen in the past was, you know, what if you do enter into these contracts with higher rates and then the expected uh, growth rates don't uh, um, meet those levels and then right. you're, you're, you're paying more and there is that offset. It goes to a lot of what we're talking about, right? It's that structural balance. When you have uh, all the federal money coming in, as you have the revenues coming in that are uh, from taxes that are being bolstered. And then you have some of these pressures that could occur for long-term contracts. Yeah, you might look comfortable now, but in a couple of years, where, where's that structural balance? Where does your ability to pay really fall out? And so we are watching that. And, and to your other question, yes, we have seen it, right? Some of these multi-year um, labor negotiation contracts that we've seen historically, right? The last five or six years, if, if you saw a 222, it was rich, right? And mm -hmm. so you very often saw contracts that were less than that. And we've started to see some that are already in the force. So as, as you're agreeing to this level of increase, and they've said we've been you know, holding it tight for a few years. We knew an increase was coming, and so we're doing it now to get ahead of the curve. And you know, the, the, the governmental agencies are saying they have a justification for these levels, but you're right. That risk is, is there. Mm -hmm. What if it is um, e exceeding the level of revenues that you're comfortable or you're projecting you'll get over time? And so that structural balance is something that we look at. It's part of this story, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want to ask uh, a couple of final questions about pensions and pension obligation bonds. Uh, do you think, you know, over the last couple of years, last two-ish years, it doesn't seem as though there has been uh, a lot of talk about credit from public pensions. Do you think that uh, the entities that face the worst of the public pension credit pressure uh, prior to COVID are healed? Or do you think that there are still issues to consider where uh, pensions and pension funding is concerned? 
Oh, uh, no, we have been saying just that. that, that it's if, if pensions were a problem before the pandemic, and rightfully so, people uh, shifted to the public health and safety needs of, of their area. Um, the, the pension problems, even with some of the strong returns, haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, we're getting greater clarity on OPEB costs, right? And those other post-employment benefit costs, in some instances, can be even greater than your long-term pension liability. So, no, these are still... Long-term obligations we view as tantamount to debt that we expect you to pay, and so we are still viewing pension and OPEB as um, credit pertinent, and mm -hmm. we're trying to get as much information as we can. So there have there's been a decent number of pension obligation bonds uh, come to market. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about when uh, you think it might make sense for uh, state and local governments to consider pension obligation bonds uh, or not. Um, th there have been a lot. We, we, we've written a, a commentary on just that. We've, see, we've seen a number of POBs, um, California, Arizona, Massachusetts. It, really, it's, it's been national, but there are little pockets where you're seeing a number of them. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that there can be an attractive um, offset if you can get a lower rate than you'd be expecting to hit for your target rate of return. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing a POB just as an arbitrage play, we do see that more as a credit risk. Mm -hmm. where, where, where we've appreciated some of the discussions we've had with management teams is where the POB may be around a broader uh, pension or benefit reform package. You know, we will uh, close a plan or we will cap this benefit or we will adjust to create a new tier. And in doing that, we recognize this risk is still out there, and so we're going to issue a POB to fund part of it, right? So those discussions are where um, it becomes more um, credit benign, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime you're taking on additional risk, anytime you're hardening a liability where, you know, if you're doing a pension, you can take a pension holiday in a tough budget year, but you're not going to take a debt service holiday. That that has a different meaning. So, you know, it, it's when you have that more rounded thought through reform package is where it's it's less credit meaningful well that was going to be my last question about uh, my last question was going to be oh. uh, how do pension obligation bonds generally impact credit quality yeah the ones that we've seen um to date uh it have not impacted credit quality um okay. I, i'm not on the I, positive side or the negative side yeah um okay. Exactly. So it was, I, there, there may have been it was one more that, that pension was neutral or pension, but or credit yeah. neutral or credit benign. Yeah, I, th I okay. think that for the majority, they're coming with this rounded plan, a broader discussion, and so you're taking on debt, but you're offsetting that other liability that we view that you're going to be obligated to pay. So if we're already considering it in one side, if you're factoring this in as an affordable cost, you can do it the other way. Now it might affect debt metrics, it might affect pension metrics. I mean, we're looking at these things in a whole, but. Um, there may have been one that had a, a negative outlook. I, I, I'm not sure, but it, for the most part, they have been more benign. Okay. Well, those are the topics that I wanted to hit. We, we did a lot today in a short amount of time, Jeff. I appreciate you uh, making the time to uh, talk to us. Yeah, no, I, Tom, I always enjoy catching up with you. I mean, I, I learn as, as we talk, so I appreciate right. the invitation and, and look forward to seeing you in person at some point soon. That's right. I can't, I can't wait. And thanks very much to those who tuned in and downloaded our recording today. And uh, we appreciate everyone for listening. Uh, for those interested, you can also see the uh, recent Hilltop Securities economic and municipal commentary and listen to our podcast by going to hilltopsecurities.com backslash commentary and you can follow me on twitter and linkedin uh thanks again everyone uh, we look forward to bringing you more color in the future related topics that intersect the worlds of politics finance and public finance this has been tom kozik from hilltop securities thanks for listening to hilltop talks a Hilltop Securities podcast where we navigate the impact of politics and finance on the financial markets. For those interested, you can view our Hilltop Securities economic and municipal commentary by visiting hilltopsecurities.com backslash municipal dash commentary and hilltopsecurities.com backslash economic 
dash commentary. You can also follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thanks again, everyone, for subscribing, tuning in, and participating. We look forward to bringing you more color in the future on topics that intersect both the world of politics and finance. This has been Tom Koslick at Hilltop Securities. This communication is intended for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice, nor is it an offer or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any investment or other specific product or service. Financial transactions may be dependent upon many factors such as, but not limited to, interest rates, tax rates, supply, and change in laws, rules and regulations, as well as changes in credit quality and rating agency considerations. The effect of such changes in such assumptions may be material and could affect the projected results. Any outcome or result Hilltop Securities or any of its employees may have achieved on behalf of our clients in previous matters does not necessarily indicate similar results can be obtained in the future for current or potential clients. Hilltop Securities makes no claim the use of this communication will assure a successful outcome. For additional information, comments, or questions, please contact Hilltop Securities, Inc. Hilltop Securities is a wholly owned subsidiary of Hilltop Holdings, New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol HTH. Hilltop Securities is located at 717 North Harwood Street, Dallas, Texas, 75201. Phone number 833-4-HILLTOP, H-I-L-L-T-O-P, and is a member of the New York Stock Exchange, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and the Securities Investor Protection Corporation.